Good evening. Shall we get started? Hello. Um, thanks for coming to Slack. Uh, this is a pretty hot topic. Uh, I've been watching solar energy production in California and I guess in the US for the last 10 years. And it's dramatic. Most of you know that, right? Price of electricity in, from solar has dropped uh, a lot. It's become so competitive, especially in my neighborhood. All my neighbors want solar panels on the roof. They are putting, renting it. The problem is solar energy is cheap, and most of the cost right now is in installation. Uh, most of the cost of it is in installation, and the problem with that is it can't get any cheaper without changing the technology. So for us to make electricity really cheap, we need to get more electricity out of the same cells that we have. That means we need new technology and new materials. And this is where our speaker today comes in. Kevin's been messing around with trying to figure out how materials work really at molecular level, how they are produced together, how they come together, and how they actually create things like electricity out of them. So I'm going to let Kevin talk about how the landscape of solar energy is going to change and what are the specific new development that are coming down the pipe in the next 10 years and some specific things that he and uh, his collaborators have been doing in trying to come with the next generation of technology that will probably hopefully bring the cost down of electricity by another factor of two or three. Uh, Kevin. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to start by just giving a, a very brief um, description of what, what the title refers to. So it's paint on solar cells. So I'm going to talk about a material that uh, is useful for solar cell technology uh, that actually starts from a liquid. You can paint this on, essentially, uh, dry it, heat it very gently, and end up with the material that you want that is very useful for solar cells. And I'm going to talk about actually watching that process happen. Uh, so what we want to understand is how you go from the liquid to the final material that you want. <coughs> So before we dive in, I'm going to give a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm a staff scientist here at SLAC. I work at SSRL, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source. Uh, so this is a picture of SSRL here. <coughs> and SSRL is a synchrotron, uh, which is basically just a big machine uh, for generating very intense x-rays. Uh, and so then we can use these x-rays to study materials or use them to study other things. Uh, before I came to SLAC, I worked across the bay at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and did most of my research at the Advanced Light Source, which is the synchrotron there. Uh, before that, I was in Long Island uh, in New York. I got my PhD at Stony Brook University, and I did most of my research at Brookhaven National Lab, working at the National Synchrotron Light Source, uh, which is here. Uh, so. My scientific career has really been heavily reliant on using synchrotrons and the x-rays that they generate uh, to study materials. So how exactly do you do that? Uh, I think most people are familiar with x-rays for sort of medical imaging. Uh, this has been around for well over 100 years. And you can use x-rays to study how things are put together. Uh, this is a famous picture from uh, 1895 of uh, Wilhelm Röntgen's wife's hand, uh, one of the first medical x-rays. And so these are a great way of looking at what's going on inside of a material, how things are put together. This is not quite the way that I use x-rays. Uh, what I typically do is scatter the x-rays off of something. So instead of looking at these go through a material and get absorbed, uh, I scatter them. So the experiment that I do uh, can be summed up in a very simple schematic. I have a sample, I shine x-rays on it, and then I look at how those x-rays scatter off. So I want to look at in certain directions, how many of my x-rays have gone in that direction. And this can tell you very interesting things about what's going on inside. And this actually gives you information about the uh, atomic structure of a material. And so all of this scattering encodes very detailed information about where the atoms are and how they're put together to make up a material. So the class of materials that I want to talk about and use, look at structurally uh, are called perovskites. And so perovskite uh, is actually a mineral. It's calcium titanium oxide, calcium titanate. Um, this is a picture of it. <coughs> so strictly speaking, it's a very specific material, but today it's become more generally used as a term to describe a particular crystal structure. Uh, 
So if you think about how the atoms are put together in this material, uh, this is a picture of where the atoms would go. This black one here would be the calcium. Uh, in the middle of this cube, you would have the titanium. And then on each face of the cube, you would have an oxygen. So this is the typical perovskite structure. Uh, it refers to more than just calcium titanate. And it's a very interesting class of materials, and it makes up the class of materials that I want to talk about tonight. But I don't want to talk about oxides. I want to talk about what I'll call hybrid perovskites, uh, which instead of an oxygen atom on these faces, they'll have something like a chlorine or an iodine or a bromine atom. And instead of just a calcium atom here, I can put some small organic molecules. So that's where the hybrid part comes in. Um, OK, so just a brief outline of what I want to try to cover. I want to talk about solar cells. I want to talk about what they are. I want to talk a little bit about how they work and what some of the current challenges are for using solar power uh, as a primary power source. Then I want to talk about these hybrid perovskites. And I'll talk a little bit about why they're interesting for solar. And I'll talk a little bit about why they're interesting to me. Uh, the two are not necessarily the same, uh, but they are related. So at its most basic, a solar cell is just some device that will convert light into electricity. It's very simple. Uh, that's really all that it does. And so you're probably familiar with this. You can use this for very large scale power generation. You can make solar farms where you can tile large areas with solar panels, uh, generate lots of power, sell it uh, at the utility scale. Uh, you can use this in a residential setting. So you can put these things on your roof. Uh, you can supplement your own residential power usage, um, potentially provide all of your own power that you need. Um, you can also do this uh, if you need power in a place that you don't have ready access, so you're off the grid. So if you need to charge your phone or GPS device when you're out hiking, you can get mobile solar panels. Uh, in rural areas, this is a great way of providing power. So this is a solar panel providing power to operate a water pump to keep your cows happy. Um, or sort of taking this to the extreme, uh, in, if you're out in space, uh, you need to generate power for satellites. You, can't plug in out there, uh, but you do have lots of sunlight, so you can use that solar panels uh, to ba basically power the electronics in your satellite. You can also do very low power uh, electronics, uh, avoiding the need to change batteries. So solar powered calculators, very common, a little less common solar powered uh, watches, but lots of different applications for solar cells. So how does that work? So what we have is light shines on a material, uh, a semiconductor. That absorber layer uh, absorbs the light, and you generate what we would call an electron hole pair. So an electron is just a negatively charged particle. And a hole, we're going to consider as a positively charged particle. This is not actually real. Uh, holes are not an actual particle. It's just convenient to think of them that way. Uh, in reality, it's more of the absence of electrons uh, that can move around, uh, but we can consider it just as a positively charged particle. So we need to get those charges out of this material so that we can do something with them. So we would put a back contact layer. So this would be like a metal layer on this. And we need a front contact layer that also needs to be conductive. And so you can see an obvious problem. If both of these are metals, how do we get the light in to absorb? And what you actually have to do is make the front contact a transparent conductor. So this is actually a very interesting class of materials. Uh, active field of research to develop new and better transparent conductors. I'm not going to talk about them. We'll just assume that we have good ones that work. We do. Uh, they could be better, but they're good enough for right now. You can then put on um, little current collectors and hook this up to a circuit. And so watching this happen, light comes in, gets absorbed and makes an electron hole pair. Those will move around, travel through the circuit, and then recombine. And so that's how you get your electrical current out of a solar cell. So this is great, but not all light is created equal. And so if we consider sunlight, which is our best source of solar power, uh, we have a wide range of wavelengths that come in. And this includes the visible spectrum, uh, which is shown here in the rainbow colors. Uh, but you can see that there's also quite a bit of light at longer wavelengths, the infrared, and some at shorter wavelengths, the ultraviolet. It turns out for... Uh, purposes of this talk, it's much easier to think about things in terms of energy instead of wavelength. And so if we convert this same solar spectrum into energy, 
uh, what we see is that there's actually a, a sizable amount of energy uh, in the uh, low energy range of the solar spectrum in the infrared. And so the thing to note here is that shorter wavelength is equal to higher energy. And we measure this photon energy, the sunlight energy in electron volts. That's just the unit that we're going to use. And so this is important for solar cells because if you have energy in your light that is below the band gap, uh, which is the minimum amount of energy that you need to create one of these electron hole pairs, you can't convert that to useful energy. And if you have energy in your light that's above that band gap, you can only use part of that. Uh, anything that's above, more than the band gap is essentially not used, it's wasted. So I want to, band gap is maybe a little bit of a nebulous idea, so we'll work from analogy here. Uh, in this case, what we're going to have is a ledge. This little guy is me, and I'm going to be throwing balls up onto this ledge. So the height of this ledge you can think of as what the band gap is, and how hard I throw this ball is how much energy is in the light that may or may not be absorbed. And so if I throw this, and if I have too little energy, uh, I can't use it. So essentially what happens, I throw the ball up, it doesn't make it all the way up to the ledge, it falls back down, I haven't accomplished anything. If I have it just right, and I give it just enough energy to correspond to that, that band gap, uh, then I can throw the ball, and I can get it up onto the ledge, and I've accomplished something. So I've absorbed this, and now I can do something useful now that I've got this ball up here. If the light has too much energy, that would be the same as throwing the ball much higher than I need to, uh, but the end result is the same. It just ends up on top of this ledge, and so all of that extra energy that I put in to throw it way above that was essentially wasted. And so you end up with low energy light that you can't use, right at the band gap where it's just right, and you can use that very efficiently, and then high energy light that you can use, but you can't use all of it. And so the reason that this is important is because it limits the efficiency of a solar cell. And so what that band gap is determines the maximum possible efficiency that you can get. It turns out that the maximum possible efficiency if you get the band gap just right is about 33%. So you can only convert about 33% of your solar energy to electricity. Um, that will change depending on your material. And so here I'm showing just some typical uh, solar absorber materials. Um, crystalline silicon, amorphous silicon, gallium arsenide, cadmium telluride, and CIGS. Um, and you can see that the maximum possible efficiency for these things is all right around 30%. Uh, so that is sort of the maximum that we're working with. And so there's a reason that this is important. So as Aperva mentioned, uh, it would be great if solar power was cheaper. And so the Department of Energy has a, a thing called SunShot, uh, which has goals for both 2020 and 2030, where they want to get the price of electricity that solar can generate down to certain levels. And so what I'm showing here are three different types of solar power. Residential, which is what you might put on your roof at home. Uh, commercial, which is similar, but if you had, say, a large warehouse and you wanted to cover the roof with solar panels there. And then utility scale, which would be sort of these large solar farms. And so as you scale up to more of the solar farm, you can get cheaper energy than if you do this just on your home. Uh, but we really want to drive the prices down. So 2016 is about where we are now, <coughs> which means that power from solar costs about 18 cents per kilowatt hour. So let's put that into slightly better terms. Um, an average home in, the, in America uses slightly less than 900 kilowatt hours per month. And at 18 cents per kilowatt hour, that's $160 per month. So if you put solar, if you're using solar to generate your electricity, that's your power bill. Every month, $160. If we can hit the SunShot 2030 goal of five cents per kilowatt hour, that's $45. So it's massive savings. So I think the incentive to do this is fairly clear. Um, but let's talk a little bit about where that price comes from. Why is it what it is? So again, I have residential, commercial, and utility scale. Uh, this is a little bit uh, more dated than the previous one, but it will do for our purposes. So if we break down the cost of building and installing solar, <coughs> what we find is that the module, so the actual solar cell itself, is this red bar. And then there's a lot of other costs built into this that we can't do a whole lot about. So looking at the SunShot 2020 goal, 
even if we could reduce the cost of the module to zero, we can make these solar cells for free, there's still a significant cost associated with that. So this is things like the cost for the infrastructure, the installation, um, all of the stuff that goes along with the solar cell. So you can't just buy this and use it, you have to put it on your roof, you have to hook it up to your electrical system, all of that stuff costs money. So how do we address this? So I'm gonna talk about two possible ways uh, that we might improve or address these challenges for solar. And one of them is to do flexible solar cells. So right now, if you wanted to buy solar cells and put them on your house, uh, they're going to be large, heavy, rigid things. That costs a lot of money and takes a lot of infrastructure to mount on your roof. If you can make something flexible, so what I'm showing here is a solar cell on a nice flexible uh, plastic substrate, basically. Um, then you could think about doing sort of a roll-to-roll -roll process. You can print a solar cell. And this is great because now you've made this thing both flexible and light. So you've potentially brought down the cost of the module itself. You don't need as much material anymore. <clears throat> and you've also brought down the cost of insta installing this and potentially of maintaining this. So that's one way of addressing uh, this price challenge. The other thing that you can do is try to make them more efficient. So with silicon, we're actually already about as good as we're probably going to do. There will be some incremental improvements, I imagine, uh, but there's not a ton of room to go. But there are some tricks that we can play. So if we think about this uh, solar spectrum and these band gaps, we can play a trick of saying, what if I stack two different solar cells on top of each other? So why would you want to do this? Well, if I take a solar cell that has a high band gap, that means that when the light shines on it, I'm going to take the high energy light and I'm going to convert that to electricity and I'm going to do it fairly efficiently. I'm going to get to use most of the high energy light energy. All of the low energy light, it's below the band gap, that solar cell can't use it. But because it can't use it, it just goes right through. So it's transparent to all of my low energy light. So what I can do is I can stick another solar cell underneath that very efficiently converts low energy light to electricity. And so what I've done is I've taken a solar cell, I've taken the high energy light, I've used it very efficiently, I've let all the other stuff go through, and then I've captured it with the second solar cell that very efficiently converts the low energy light and wouldn't have done very well with this high energy stuff anyway, it only would have been able to use a par portion of it. <clears throat> so essentially what we can accomplish with this assuming that we can do something like this cheaply without increasing the cost of the module, is we bring the total cost down. Because now, for the same piece of hardware and the same installation cost, I'm generating more power. Of course, this does rely on being able to do something like this without increasing your cost dramatically for the module itself. That's a big challenge. Okay. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit now, or I want to point something out, which is that on this little chart, I've got two different types of silicon. I've got crystalline silicon, and I've got amorphous silicon. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means, but I want to point out that they're both silicon, they're both made out of the same material, but they have very different band gaps. One is 1.1 EV, the other is 1.7 EV. So before we jump into hybrid perovskites and why they're interesting, I want to take a small detour into the structure of materials. <clears throat> so this is a very old field. Um, we can go back to the early 1600s with Johannes Kepler, uh, who noticed that snowflakes tend to always have six sides. And he wondered why. Uh, he wasn't the first person to do this, but he was the first person to really uh, come up with a nice, compelling answer. And he wrote up a little uh, pamphlet on this as a New Year's gift to a friend of his. And so he hypothesized that you get this uh, six-sided shape always because snowflakes come from packing the spheres of water atoms. So he didn't know that water was not just an atom, uh, but that if you take water atoms and you pack them together, you like to pack them into a hexagonal shape. Okay, so let's follow that logic. Uh, we're not going to use water atoms, we're going to think about how you would stack fruit. So we're going to take a bunch of oranges, these are approximating spheres for us, uh, and we're going to think about how we can actually pack them together. 
So the easy answer is to say, well, let's just take them all and dump them in a box. This can just happen randomly. We don't need to worry about how they go in there. We're just going to dump them in there and let them sort themselves out. So there's no order to this. Uh, and it turns out that if you do this uh, and you have uh, perfectly round oranges that are all the same size, you will fill up about 64% of the box that you dump these into. Uh, just an interesting note, if they're not round, if they're M&M shaped, you can do a little bit better. And you can fill up 68% of the box that you dump a bunch of M&Ms into. Okay, so can we do better than random? I mean, is it worth taking the time to try to do this in a more ordered way? Well, there are two ways you might think of doing this in an ordered way. You can do sort of a square packing, where you set them next to each other like this, in sort of this square format. Or you can do a hexagonal packing, where you get sort of staggered layers uh, that give you this sort of hexagonal form here. And it turns out that hexagonal is actually significantly better. If you stack your oranges this way, you can fill up 74% of space. So if I order the way that I put my oranges into the box, I can fit more oranges into the box. One of the reasons that this is important is because nature seems to like to do things like this that can pack more efficiently. But the interesting thing to note is there's more than one way to put these things together. And so this random picture, this is what amorphous silicon would look like. And something like this ordered picture is what the crystalline silicon would look like. And so you can see that you get different behaviors depending on how you put these things together. So that starts to address the question of does any of that actually matter? I can put these things together in different ways, so what? Well, let's take a very simple case. We're going to just look at carbon. So we're just going to take a single element, and we're going to look at what happens when we put carbon atoms together. And so you're probably familiar with two very common forms of this. Uh, one is graphite. So this is what you would find in your pencil lead. This is gray. It's very soft. Uh, the other is diamond. This is clear and essentially the hardest material that we know. So they're very different materials, but they're both just carbon atoms. So why are they so different? And it turns out it's because you've put those carbon atoms together differently. So if you look at how the carbon atoms get arranged in graphite, uh, what you basically have are these little hexag hexagons that you link together to form this sheet, and then you just stack these sheets. And that's what graphite looks like if you could zoom in and look at the atoms themselves. Diamond is very different. Uh, this is what we would call the diamond lattice. Um, <coughs> and you get this much more three-dimensionally connected network of carbon atoms. And so the point is, how you put the atoms together determines a material's properties. So this is the structure-function relationship that condensed matter physics and material science really focuses on. And this is also what makes perovskites so interesting to me. So let's get back to these hybrid perovskites and talk a little bit about why they're interesting for solar. So what I'm showing you here, this is the structure that you have for the um, sort of the first perovs hybrid perovskite that got really hot for solar applications. Uh, this is methyl ammonium, uh, so that's the small organic molecule. So I have a carbon atom, which is blue, or sorry, which is brown, a nitrogen atom, which is blue. I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, they each have three hydrogens attached to them. And so this little molecule is methyl ammonium. I'm going to call it MA for short. <coughs> and what I have then is also lead and iodide. So here's my methyl ammonium. Inside these octahedra is my lead atom. And then at each of these corners is an iodide atom. And so this is that perovskite structure. I'm showing more of these octahedra, but this is that typical perovskite structure. And this particular one has a band gap of 1.55 electron volts. This is almost exactly where you want it for the most efficient solar cell, so that's great. Uh, and I'm showing sort of where that is on the spectrum here. So one of the things that makes these perovskites very interesting is that we can mix and match what we put into this. So instead of this methyl ammonium, why don't I swap that out for a slightly different small organic molecule? Uh, it's not very much bigger. So now I have two nitrogens and a carbon and I can stick that in the same spot. And I've changed the structure slightly because I've changed the chemistry, and I've also changed the band gap just slightly. I've lowered it just a little bit, uh, not a big change. Um, I can play other games, going back to this starting methyl ammonium lead iodide. So this is the same one that we started with. Um, 
I can swap out the iodine. And instead I can put in chlorine. And so one of the effects of putting in chlorine is that the uh, size of this structure shrinks a little bit. Uh, so it gets a little smaller. And the band gap shifts very dramatically. So now it's almost three electron volts. Uh, this is probably a little too high to want to use for a solar cell unless you're making a tandem. Even then it may be a little bit on the high side. Instead of chlorine or iodine, I can use bromine. And so now I get a much bigger structure that the whole thing expands a little bit. And I shift my uh, band gap back down to about 2.3. So I can play lots of games with the composition. That influences the structure. And that influences the properties of that material. So this is a fun field to play around in. So how does this relate to solar? Why, why would these be interesting to solar? Well, what I've just talked about means that these things are tunable. I can make them have whatever properties I need them to have for the solar cell that I want to build. And so it's a great thing if I want to build these tandems because I can make the band gap whatever I need it to be for either the top or the bottom solar cell or for both. Uh, these could both be two different types of perovskite or I could build a perovskite solar cell on top of a silicon solar cell. And so this lets me give, this gives me potentially a useful way of building more efficient solar cells by combining different materials. The other thing that makes these very promising for solar is that they're typically solution processed. Uh, and what this means is that they're cheap because all I need to do is dissolve some starting material in a liquid, uh, somehow generate a film from that, and there are many ways to do it. Uh, what we typically do in the lab because we're working on a small scale is what we call spin coating. So you would take, say, a piece of glass and you would spin it very quickly and just drip the liquid on top. And then it would spread out, it would dry, and you would be left with a little thin film on top of your, your glass. Uh, that's not a very good way of making large areas. Uh, it doesn't scale, but there's a lot of other options. Uh, you can basically uh, spread a thin film on top of something. <clears throat> this is basically a print head. Or you can do sort of a spray coating and build sort of a little spray can of the solution and deposit a thin film that way. So the typical approach then is you have some solution, uh, you deposit it in some way, it dries into a film. That film may not be the perovskite that you want, and so typically you would do a little heating to transform that into what you want. Once you have the perovskite, you can do some post-processing, you can do other things to treat it, uh, to try to improve the quality, try to change the properties slightly. I'm not gonna talk really about any of that, um, but it is an active field about what you can do once you've made these perovskite films to try to improve them. <coughs> but I'm gonna focus more on these uh, first steps. So as I said, um, we can print these things. So what I'm showing here is actually a little small printer that we built for use on the beam lines at SSRL. Um, so this is the print head, this thing right here. This is a microscope slide. And then this dark film on top is actually the perovskite. And so what we're doing is um, basically depositing some of the solution, some of this liquid, and then dragging this blade across to give a nice thin film. And so it looks something like this, and it gives rise to this perovskite film on top of this microscope slide. Uh, there's a movie of this I'll try to play. Um, so let me just orient everybody. This is the same printer setup. So you can sort of see there's a microscope slide right here. Over here, this black thing with the silver underneath, that's the print head. So what's going to happen is it's going to move the microscope slide into place, and then the print head is going to drag down and leave behind a dark film of the perovskite. So it's moving the slide into place. There goes the print head. And once it goes clear a little bit, you'll see above it, we've left behind this nice film of perovskite. So we're basically printing this stuff now. Uh, we can print a nice layer um, and basically paint this on. So this is great because it means that this whole roll-to-roll -roll idea works for perovskites. And so perovskites have the potential to uh, work very well for tandems to give us more efficient solar cells by designing the properties of the material that we want and for being useful in sort of this roll-to-roll -roll processing to make light and flexible solar cells as well. So what we're doing now is sort of replacing this processing 
series of steps with more of a roll-to-roll -roll process where we can just run a piece of plastic through and out comes a big roll of flexible solar cell at the other end. This would be the goal. Okay, so that's more or less why these things are interesting for solar applications, but I wanna talk also about why they're interesting to me. So if we go back to this picture, uh, we can play around with the composition of this structure quite a lot. So we can change out, mix and match these materials uh, to get sort of a different material at the end. And so there's two very puzzling questions that sort of come out of this. One is, why can we make so many different perovskites? Why can I change the composition and still end up with the same basic structure? What's, what's so special about this thing? The other one that I haven't really motivated yet, but I'm going to uh, explain a little bit in the next couple slides, is that we can actually make the same perovskite, so we can make the same material, the same structure, the same composition, it's made of the same stuff, uh, it has the same form, but we can actually make it in lots of different ways. And I'm not talking about just different ways of making that film, I'm talking about actually starting from a different solution. So we can make the same thing even if what we start with is different. So I'll give some examples. So a very easy way to make this is to take two powders. One is lead iodide, so it's just lead and iodine. The other is that methyl ammonia molecule and iodine. I take those two, I dissolve them in a solution, I make a film, I heat it up, and I end up with this material. If I triple the amount of this one ingredient that I put in, I end up with the exact same thing. If I actually swap out the iodine that I put in with the lead for chlorine, I end up with the exact same thing. The chlorine is gone, it's all iodide at the end. I can actually swap it out for a different thing, an acetate, so that's this little molecule here, and again, I end up with the exact same thing. So I have four different recipes for making exactly the same material. So that's puzzling. Why does it always want to be this? Why is that the structure? And why is that the composition that seems to be so strongly preferred? So to try to address some of this, um, I'm gonna talk about a particular one, which is if we put in chlorine, uh, how does all of this work? How do we get from this starting solution to this end point where we've lost all of our chlorine? So naively, and when people first started using this particular way of making perovskites, they thought that they could end up somewhere in between the pure iodine and the pure chlorine. So if you change the amount of chlorine that you put in, you end up somewhere in the middle here, which is a blend of these two endpoints. So you get a blend of the two structures and therefore a blend of the two properties. And so this is really the tunability where I can now fine tune the properties to be anywhere in between these two extremes that I want. It turns out that doesn't work uh, because you don't end up with chlorine. So where does the chlorine go? So if we think about what happens in the solution, I've mixed in some chlorine here, and I've mixed in the iodine here. And so what I have, at least naively, is that my lead atom, which is this black one here, should be bound to two, on average, chlorine atoms. And so it should not know about the iodines, essentially, but it should have a bond with the chlorine. But there's a few things to note. This works. If I actually try to mix these things in solution, everything works, it all dissolves, it's great. If I leave out this methyl ammonium iodide and just try to dissolve that lead chloride, it doesn't dissolve. I end up with a bunch of leftover solid at the bottom and I can't actually dissolve all of it. If I add in the methyl ammonium iodide, no problem. Everything dissolves, nice solution, I can go from there. The other thing to note is that if you make a film from this and let it dry, these starting materials, which are solid, that's not what you get. You get something different. Uh, and so what this is really suggesting is that even in the solution, chemistry is happening. The lead is actually changing its bond. It doesn't want to be bound to these chlorines. It actually prefers to be bound to the iodine. Uh, this is a little bit strange. It's not very intuitive because iodine and chlorine should behave very similarly uh, from a chemical perspective but this does seem to be what happens in solution. So already at the solution stage, we're starting to prefer iodine over chlorine. If we look at what that dried film looks like, uh, we actually can get a crystal structure. It's actually two materials. One of them is ordered. So I'm showing that here as these uh, connected octahedra. 
And then one of them is not ordered, um, which is sort of a methyl ammonium and chlorine. And if you think about what's in this ordered structure, it's actually only half of the chlorine that you put into the whole thing. So again, there seems to be this preference for iodine over chlorine in the way that this stuff comes together. So then we can heat this stuff up and make it into the perovskite that we want. Uh, so we actually do this on the beam line. Uh, we built a little heating chamber so we can put our sample on a little stage. The stage gets hot. We can shine our x-rays in and then we can measure what scatters off of them. And so what I want to point out is that um, for, to simplify a little bit, the scattering that we're going to measure, you can think of as sort of a fingerprint of these different uh, phases, these different crystal structures and these different materials. So if we look at what um, this scattering looks like, what we start off with are these series of little peaks. These are sort of the fingerprint for that precursor structure. And as we heat it up, that starts to disappear. We get these rings that are sort of the fingerprint for the perovskite that we want. And so we can actually watch this transformation happen in real time using the x-rays at SSRL. Okay, so I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, but because we can look at the fingerprint for those different phases, we can actually watch what happens as a matter of time. So we've taken this dried film We've heated it up, in this case to 100 degrees Celsius, so not very hot. Uh, and we can watch what happens over time. And one thing that you'll notice is in the first 15 minutes, not much is happening. So this blue line is the amount of perovskite that we have in the film, and there isn't any. Uh, this green line is the amount of that precursor that we have, and it goes up a little bit, but essentially nothing is happening for 15 minutes. We're sitting here, the thing is hot, 15 minutes go by, apparently nothing has happened. It's only after about 15 minutes that we see the transformation happen where we lose that starting phase and we gain the perovskite that we want. So it takes a full 15 minutes before the conversion even starts. Uh, then for some amount of time, everything is happy. And then we can actually over anneal it. We can sort of over bake it um, and we lose a little bit of perovskite and it actually degrades into lead iodide. Um, so there is sort of a a certain amount of time beyond which you don't really want to do this. Uh, you don't just want to heat it up and leave it forever. Uh, there is a certain amount of time that is optimal. So we can actually now understand this whole process. So what's actually happening from this transformation? So if we think about what's going on at sort of a molecular and, and atomistic level, we have this ordered phase, this ordered material, and then we have sort of this disordered material. And as we heat it up, what happens is we start removing chlorine from the film. And the easiest way to remove chlorine from the film is to take this disordered stuff and drive it off as just gas. So we heat it up and it goes away from the film. We lose it. After we've lost all of this easy stuff, there's still chlorine in the film and we're still gonna continue to remove that chlorine from the film, but now we have to take it from this ordered stuff because that's all the chlorine that we have left. And so the way that that works is we can peel it off of one of these octahedra. It combines with one of these methyl ammonium molecules. And again, it just leaves the system. It gets hot, it leaves it as gas. And so then you can also sort of see, if I had to take this atom off of this corner, I've got an empty spot. I don't wanna have an empty spot. I'd like to fill that up somehow. Um, so what I can do is I can actually take this one here and just connect them. And so you can sort of see that I can lose half of those sites and connect them up with a neighbor. And this whole thing can collapse into this perovskite structure. And so we can really understand the whole mechanism that we transform from the dried film to the perovskite. And we can understand why the dried film looks like it does because of what goes on in solution. <coughs> so we really understand this entire process from what goes on in solution and why we end up with what we end up with, why there's no chlorine left at the final stage. So I should note this particular way of making perovskite using chlorine, it actually makes very good films and there's no chlorine left, but you have to heat it up at 100 degrees for about an hour. And that is actually a problem. <clears throat> and the reason is we want to print perovskites, right? This is one of our selling points is that we can make sort of a roll to roll setup like this we can print these things, we can make them light and flexible, we can print a whole lot of it, so everything gets cheap. But if you need to do something where you have to heat it for an hour, 
If you think that we're going to print at one meter per minute, which is probably on the slow side, that means that you need an oven that's 60 meters long. And that doesn't seem very realistic. Uh, if you're going to build a factory and you want to build a roll-to-roll -roll printer to make perovskite solar cells, you really don't want to have to build an oven that is that big. So what we want to do is use the understanding of how we form this uh, and why this long heating time preparation gives us such good quality films and use that knowledge to design a process that takes less time but does not sacrifice the quality. Uh, so if we can really understand this, we can build towards things that we can do both fast and with good quality. The other thing to note, uh, this result was sort of counterintuitive, right? We added in a bunch of stuff at the beginning and what we ended up with at the end didn't have it, it was gone. Uh, so you don't always make what your intuition tells you that you're going to make. And this is important because if you want to tune the properties of your material, you need to know what you're making. So again, one of the selling points for perovskites is that you can engineer the solar cell material to do things like build these tandems and make the most efficient devices possible. But that only works if you're actually making what you think you're making. Uh, if you're making something different, and you try to build it into one of these devices, it's not going to work because you didn't put the right thing in. So I uh, just want to briefly touch then on the possible future for perovskites. Uh, these are an amazingly flexible class of materials. Uh, you can do a lot to play around with the chemistry and change what you put into these things and what you end up with. And you can also do a lot to change the way that you make them. So even if you start from a very different recipe, add in different materials to start with, that doesn't necessarily mean you're getting something different at the end, and that's a very fascinating puzzle. Why, why do you get perovskite so easily out of these things, and why can you get the same perovskite from so many different starting places? Uh, for solar, these are great because you can potentially print these, so you can make them into light and flexible solar cells, and if you can do it right, you can tune their properties, and so you can really tailor this to whatever application you want and make sure that it gets you exactly what you want to have at the end. And so that makes this a, a viable route to both cheaper and easier solar power in the future. Um, before I end, uh, science is a collaborative process, especially if you're at a large user facility like this uh, SSRL. And so this all has been a very collaborative work and I wanna thank some of the collaborators uh, especially. Um, so I wanna thank Chris Tassoni uh, who's also a staff scientist here at SLAC, uh, and his group, uh, especially Karsten, Karsten Bruning, who's done a lot of the work on this uh, that I've shown here. <coughs> I also want to thank Laura Schellis, who is another staff scientist here at SLAC, uh, who I've been working with a lot on these perovskite materials and solar cell devices that you make from them. And then Mike Tony and his group, and especially R. Eagle Parker, uh, who I've also worked with a lot on the material that I've talked about here today. So um, thank you for paying attention. I hope this has been enjoyable and educational, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. So before you ask questions, uh, we are taping this. So uh, Kevin and I will pick one of you, but then there's a microphone in front of you, and there's a button, you should press it, and then after you stop, Speaking, turn it off because only one microphone can be on at a time. So, who wants to ask questions? What I'm interested in would be the uh, durability and longevity of this flexible class of material. Yep, and that is actually uh, probably the main challenge for perovskites right now. So, um, these make very high quality uh, solar cells, but they don't make very durable solar cells. So, they're very susceptible to water. Um, water has a tendency to degrade them. And I think also as a consequence of the fact that you can make them with such gentle heating, uh, if they get hot, they can also degrade fairly easily. Uh, so there's a lot of research going into how do you uh, encapsulate these. So if I can make it, how can I basically contain it so that nothing can change? I, no water can get in, uh, nothing can leave the system. Um, there's a lot of work going into that right now. That's the main challenge, I feel, in perovskites. Uh, but it is a big issue because um, if you think about the competition, which would be something like silicon solar cells, these things come with a 20-year warranty or even longer now 
And it's very difficult to design something that might have issues with degradation that you can claim will last and be effective for 20 or 30 years. So that is a big issue. Is the 60 meter oven really a problem? Can I squiggle it back and forth in a reasonable size box? Uh, you could, um, but also if you, it's sort of a limitation on how much you can produce though. Because uh, if you build an oven of a certain size, even if you, you know, wrap the thing and go through a lot of uh, sort of back and forth to put a lot of material inside a smaller oven, uh, you can only run your, your roll to roll so fast before you need to make the oven bigger. Uh, it also starts to become a problem because sort of the startup of a feed um, becomes a little bit of a problem because you have such a long roll to roll line. Uh, and so sort of feeding that through the first time can start to become problematic, I, I believe, as well. Um, but, I mean, you're right. The, the 60 meter oven is a little bit of an oversimplification. There are ways around it. But it's also not um, a very compelling feature for a production line that you need to do such a, a long heating cycle. Kevin, there's a question from the web. Okay. They want, they want to know if you can make perovskite without lead. Um, you can. Uh, so there's a lot of work going into replacing the lead with tin. Obviously, you would prefer not to put a bunch of lead on your roof. Uh, lead is toxic, um, not ideal. So there's a lot of work going into replacing the lead with something like tin, which is more benign. Um, so far, that's been problematic because while you can make those materials, they don't seem to work very well as solar cells. So the efficiencies that you can get, uh, the power conversion efficiencies are much lower than they are for lead-based perovskites. Hi, uh, Paul Adriani from Sun Power. On the um, wiggly approach, I guess that's called serpentine. I think mm -hmm. the limitation there is you're touching both sides of the film, I think, when you do a serpentine before you've perhaps stabilized that surface. That's true. And you can also um, protect against that with air bearings so you don't actually touch. Then your side to side guiding becomes difficult because you have no friction holding you in place. It's not impossible, but I think that's one of the issues there. Um, I guess the question about the water sensitivity, does it need amazing protection well beyond what's already done in the industry with glass glass modules and desiccant and butyl rubber around the border? Um, so I would say it's, it's not a completely understood problem or just yet uh, exactly how detrimental water is. So um, if, you, if you look at some of the early work, there was a lot of debate about whether or not these things needed to be made in a completely water-free environment or if sort of low humidity was, was okay or even good. Um, I don't know that that has been definitively answered. And in terms of longevity, once you've actually built the thing, uh, it doesn't take a lot of water exposure to start the degradation process. And so the encapsulants that you might use to sort of seal it up, uh, partly the issue is those also need to work for 20 or 30 years and maintain their integrity. And that's also a difficult challenge. Uh, so I think they do really require something beyond what is typically done, uh, or at least um, are more prone to failure if, if you think about the typical failure rate of what, is, what the uh, current technology is. So if you take what is typically done now, apply it to the perovskites, uh, your failure rate is probably a little too high. Um, I don't know the details of that. This is sort of my, my assumption, um, but it, they are very sensitive to moisture. Oh, can you turn your, your microphone off, please? Thank you. Hello? Okay. I was wondering why they would want to replace one of the iodines with chlorine. Um, so one of the reasons is that you can change the properties of the material. So if you can actually uh, take out some of the iodine and put in some chlorine, uh, you, what you end up doing is making a different material that would work better as sort of the top solar cell in one of these two solar cell devices because you make it more efficient for high energy light. 
and then it's transparent to the low energy light. And so it's a way of tuning that, that property a little bit. Um, that's one possible reason. There are some other reasons. It turns out that if you do it, if you make the perovskite that way, you end up with a higher quality material. It's the same material, it's just sort of a higher quality film. Um, I don't know that that's particularly well understood exactly why. Uh, I think it might have something to do with the fact that the way it transforms is different and slow and you go through this intermediate phase. Um, but there's, the two main reasons are one, um, it doesn't give you the chlorine at the end stage, but it gives you a higher quality film if you use that method. The other is if you could put in the chlorine at the end, it lets you tune the properties a little bit. And so that can be very useful. Would it be like cheaper than the iodine? Uh, I don't believe so, at least not significantly, but I'm not certain of that. How, how, how thick is the top layer on the stack? Um, which layer do you mean? The, if you think about the, so the way that you would typically make one of these is actually a little bit backwards. Uh, what you would do is you would have something like a piece of glass, uh, and that can be a millimeter or more thick. Uh, then you would have that transparent conductor, uh, which can be maybe a micron or a few hundred nanometers thick. Uh, the film of the perovskite itself is a couple hundred nanometers. That seems to be about the ideal for absorbing as much light as possible and still getting good conversion. Uh, and then you would put uh, a metal on top of that. There's actually another layer that goes in between um, <coughs> a whole transport layer and then you would put the metal on. So everything can be made quite thin uh, on sort of the micron or more thinner scale, uh, except for in this case, the glass. But if you replace that with something like a plastic film, that can be made quite thin as well, which is how you get to the flexible. You got a question. A side note, what will happen if you will use fluorine instead of chlorine or iodine or bromine? I just wonder. Uh, I am not sure. Um, Chris Tassoni right here in the white shirt, uh, I think is maybe the one to answer that. Uh, yeah, I think you would turn on your mic. Uh, you, you would widen the band gap so that it's not a particularly useful for this application. Yeah, yeah. what is the efficiency of the current um, perovskite? Uh, so the record efficiency, which is actually made from a um, complicated combination of materials, it's uh, in, uh, formidimium, uh, cesium, uh, lead iodide, bromide, but the record for this class of materials I think is now about 22%. Um, but that's also on a, on a fairly small uh, solar cell, so this isn't something on a scale that you would um, say install as a actual power generation. This is more of a lab scale uh, component. Uh, and that's tested at a one sun type efficiency? That's one sun, yeah. So there are standard ways of testing solar cells. There's um, typically under one sun illumination, there's a certain spectrum uh, that's well defined that uh, approximates what, uh, what different wavelengths hit the surface because the atmosphere absorbs some. Um, so it's under fairly standard conditions. And then one other question, uh, you showed a chart with uh, theoretical efficiencies of mm -hmm. silicon and various materials. And uh, is the difference between the theoretical and today's uh, solar cells mainly explained just by the frequencies of light that aren't absorbed? So that's a lot of what goes into that, that maximum possible efficiency. Uh, the reason that we're not quite there is because you can't really make a perfect device. So there's a lot of other places that you can lose um, efficiency. So one is that uh, when light comes down and hits your solar cell, it doesn't all go through and get absorbed. Some of it gets reflected. So you want to minimize how much light gets back reflected out because if it's reflected, you can't absorb it, you can't use it. Um, there are a number of other places that you can lose uh, efficiency. You can lose uh, basically the ability to generate power. One is that that electron in that hole uh, if they find each other, they sort of annihilate and they go away. 
And so if they find each other before the electron has a chance to go through your circuit, that's lost power. So there's a, there's a number of areas where you lose this, and it's really the fact that you can't build the perfect solar cell, uh, especially not at scale, uh, that prohibits us from really reaching those limits. Do you have the, an idea, though, of what percentage of the loss, the difference between the theoretical and actual, is because of the spectrum that's not being absorbed, just as a you know, approximate? So that, that's been worked out. Um, I can't really tell you off the top of my head, but um, Shockley and Quiser, there's a thing called the Shockley-Quiser limit, which is where these numbers come from. Uh, they basically sat down and figured out that if you could build the perfect solar cell, then you have these different losses that there's no way to avoid, such as not being able to use all of the light efficiently. Um, this is how much power you could generate, and that's actually where those maximum values come from, is that, that formulation. How do you determine the band gap? Is it as a function of the um, components? Is it well understood and calculatable, or is it empirical? And if so, how do you do it? It's, it's generally empirical. Um, there are theories uh, that will let you calculate it, but they tend to be wrong. Uh, they tend to underestimate that um, pretty consistently. So it's generally just measured, uh, and, and it's an optical measurement. You can use optical light. You can uh, get it determined pretty accurately that way. Um, hello, my name's Chris Davis. I go to Fremont, and I'm Miss Dudley Six Block. And uh, my question is, which elements make the best perovskite? So, if you're thinking about for solar application, um, lead, for whatever reason, seems to be very critical. You can't really get away from the lead. Uh, iodine seems to also be uh, very critical. Although if you use a little bit of bromine or a little bit of chlorine, you can improve things a little bit. But it seems to be pretty hard to get away from lead. And it seems like you want primarily iodine for most formulations. But that's a little bit more flexible. The lead seems to be the thing that you can't do without. Um, if a way to encapsulate the perovskite was found, and the films became functional in place of solar panels, would the cost still be lower than solar panels even with the added price for the protection of the films? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat it a little? So if protection for the films were, was found, like a way to um, protect the perovskite from the weather and stuff, mm -hmm. would the cost of uh, putting those in place of solar panels still be less than solar panels? Uh, generally, yeah. Um, if you can make it flexible and light, that brings down a lot of the costs that you just can't get away from with silicon. Um, because silicon is big and heavy, uh, and so you have to make sure that it's installed properly. There's a lot that goes along with it. If you can make it lighter and flexible, then a lot of those costs will go away. Um, and the other potential thing is if you can put this on top of silicon, uh, you can basically boost the efficiency of silicon. And if you can do that cheaply, which is the key, uh, then you can bring down the cost quite a bit because now for not much additional cost, you're generating a lot more power. Those cost oh, my voice is so loud, I don't even need this. Those cost goals that the government is defining, what mm -hmm. are those based on? Is there like a certain proportion of people they want to have solar or? Um, at least in part, I think that's, that's coming from what they think it needs to be for solar to really be competitive. Uh, and to really start to gain significant market share. I don't know exactly how they arrive at those numbers. Um, Chris might know a little bit more, but uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what goes into to coming up with those, those prices that they want as the goal. Do you want to address that, Chris? It's, it's uh, sorry, it's purely competition, as Kevin pointed out. So. It, saying that this is how much it costs to generate uh, coal-generated power, and if we want renewables to be cost competitive, this is where they need to be to be economically feasible. Um, I want to know, if you sealed it inside of a vacuum, would that be able to protect it from the weather? Um, 
if you could seal it that way, it, it could help. Uh, it turns out, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I have a very limited amount, so I'm, I'll speak from that. If you put these things in a vacuum, um, one thing that tends to happen is that certain components uh, will actually start to be sucked out of it. Um, so the methyl ammonium can actually leave the film and it starts to degrade into just lead iodide, which is not a good solar cell material. Um, so vacuum is not necessarily a great answer, but if you do have it encapsulated, if you can seal it up inside something, uh, then at least if you've done that well, putting that whole thing in vacuum should be fine. Um, but putting vacuum on the materials themselves, I think is not, not a good thing. I think it, it leads to them falling apart. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I was just wondering, have you considered any other industrial applications for perovskites? Um, a little bit, uh, not a ton. So I'm, I'm actually not, the industrial applications are not really my focus. I mean, it's, it's definitely part of the motivation for why these are interesting to study. Um, they're potentially just a really nice semiconductor that you can make from solution. So anywhere that you might use semiconductors, um, electronics, um, LEDs, uh, things like this, they, they may have potential application. Some people are exploring that, but um, I haven't really given it a ton of thought. Maybe I'll, I'll say something on that. So it's Slack or uh, DOE itself, there are several stages of uh, going from lab to marketplace, commercialization. And then for some reason, there are 10 steps, right? Because 10 sounds like a good number. So a lot of the stuff that Kevin is doing is something from somewhere between like number two to number four. And then at some point, somebody in a startup company will start taking from number four to number seven or number six, and eventually it'll become a commercial product and how that happens, right? So it's sort of a relay game on how you translate basic science understanding of all these things on molecular level, which is something we do at Slack, and then translate that into marketplace and how that scale-up process happens is tricky because there are all these places where it gets lost, right? And trying to get it all together in the right way is one of the things that we try to do as a group as well, right? So, I mean, this understanding, but then also doing a whole bunch of lab practices and scale-up practices to see really how it happens is how we actually make a final product that you sell to somebody. Right? So it's a tricky process. It's a very important process as well. Go ahead. Is the graphs that you showed about the, um, uh, is a gap of 15 minutes, does it have to do with the nucleation point starting or? Uh, that 15 minute period is really just the time it takes to drive off um, that other chlorine. Okay, so um, not necessarily so, nucleation So that point. only happens so fast and that's about how long it takes. Uh, if you if you do it hotter or if you do it, if you change some things a little bit, you can change the amount of time that that is. But it, the, what has to happen before you start that conversion process is the same. You have to get rid of that extra chlorine. But if you're doing it too fast, then as a, it will not be the same quality, I bet. The details of how you do it can change the quality of the final film, yeah. And exactly how is a little bit of a mystery. Uh, it's difficult to explore that um, very thoroughly and systematically. Um, it's also a little bit difficult to decide how do you measure the quality of the final film. There are different ways of saying this is a better film than this one. So it's, it, it gets a little tricky, um, but uh, a lot of this has sort of been studied at least um, reasonably well to find s at least something close to the optimal way of doing things for different ways of making the material. So let's thank Kevin again. Uh, Thank you.